May no barrier come between any of us and your everlasting love, dear Creator, as we worship you now. Let us quiet ourselves in preparation for worship. Carol, what a beautiful message this morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. On this Mother's Day, we rejoice that you've come to worship the one who has set us in families. Please know that you are always welcome in God's house of worship. Good morning. This week is a busy week. Uh, PW meets this morning for the last, I think, lesson of our Bible study at 10 a.m. on Wednesday. Um, Friday and Saturday is the Spring Food Drive, Friday at Fairway and High V at Saturday. So make sure those of you who've signed up make those times. This is an important time to help people who are hungry. Yes. Okay. She's saying they need help at five o'clock on Friday and five thirty Saturday to help unload the food that is collected at the food pantry located on uh, behind Burger King. Behind Burger King, yes, okay. Uh, lay leaders are needed, so sign up, please. Uh, the rummage sale was a big success, I believe. And um, heads up, in 
Two weeks is Pentecost, and we ask everyone to wear red, if you can, on that day. And always remember those on our prayer list. And Helen has a minute for mission. I'm going to leap to my feet. Good morning. Everywhere he looked, the Reverend Alan Shelton saw tremendous gaps. Keeping the high school age young people of color from succeeding in life. Reverend Shelton, a veteran educator, community advocate, and pastor in New Jersey, was determined not to watch promising youth fall through the cracks of an increasingly broken educational system. He wanted to ensure the future success of primarily urban, adolescent young people. So in 2010, he founded Good Success Academies. Good Success Academies has become a tremendously successful program, outgrowing the church and expanding beyond its original goal of serving Montclair area youth. In the 12 years since its founding, the once local initiative, in partnership with Montclair State University and Rutgers University, now impacts youth in surrounding communities, readying them for college, work, and the world. Tarek Mail, that's one of the young men, is grateful for his good success experience. I got into good success because our high school principal was handing out flyers, he recalled. It helped me to get a job. Previously, I didn't know what to wear or what to say at an interview. Good success helped me figure it out, including what type of suits to wear something we just take for granted. Tarek also credits good success for helping him to write the application essays that earned him acceptance into Montclair State University, where he is now studying computer science. Helping youth achieve their God-given potential is what the Pentecost offering one of the PCUSA's four special offerings is all about. Not only do gifts to the Pentecost offering benefit at-risk children and youth through the Educated Child Transform the World National Initiative, but offering also encourages development and supports the church young people through the Young Adult Volunteer Program and the Presbyterian Youth. Forty percent of the Pentecost offering is retained by individual congregations just like ours for local ministries that support young people, while the remaining 60 percent is used to support children at risk, youth, and young adults through ministries of the Presbyterian Mission Agency. Here at our church, we are using our portion of the offering to purchase fan for people in need during the hot Iowa summers. If someone wanted to know why they should give to the Pentecost offering, I would explain that programs like Good Success Academies allow young people to get a better understanding of how to get a job and how to be a leader. Your gift, your generosity makes a difference. For as we always say, when we all do a little, it adds up to a lot to reach the potential you gave them. We are grateful for those, we are grateful 
for those who work with children. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we pray that all children will be able to reach the potential you gave them. We are grateful for those who work alongside children at risk and give them hope. Give all of us the faith and courage to stand up for children and help build a brighter future for them. Amen. Number one, it's number 188 in the glory to God. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Join me in the responsive call to worship. Bless the Lord, O people, sing. Let the sound of praise ring out. Come and hear what the Lord has done. The Lord, Lord who has made everything. In God's presence we praise and worship. And our opening hymn is Make a Joyful Noise to God. Number 54. is lost to God. All are welcome to witness and receive God's saving grace. Let us confess our sins before our Savior. Let us pray. Holy, Holy God, God, we, we are, are quick to criticize, quick to judge, quick to blame. We, we fail to offer others the same grace we receive from you. We hold ourselves up as better than some, and, and fail to recognize the ways this keeps others down. Forgive us, help us to seek understanding and compassion, help us to accept the love you offer us, and share your love with others. Amen. Please join me in the responsive assurance of God's grace. Christ transforms, redeems, and renews. Through Christ's death and resurrection, we are a new creation, 
ready to sing God's glory and testify to God's grace. Sisters and brothers, believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Carol, thank you for your help. Carol, thank you for the beautiful music. And would the young people join me for some time together up front? Good morning. It's good to see you guys. Um, this morning, I want to show you a picture of a friend of mine. This is a picture of my friend and our family member. Her name is Derpa. Derpa. That's a funny name, isn't it? Our son gave this cat. No. You know who gave this cat to us? God. Do you have a cat? Do you? You have 10 dogs. Any cats? Huh? One cat. Does the cat have a name? Tenny? Tenny. No, oh, that's a great name. So, this cat was one time all alone in the world. She was underneath a car and going, ow, ow. She was sad because she was all alone. And a friend of our sons heard her crying and went out and got her and brought her into the house. And she's been ours ever since. Now she's a member of our family. She adopted us, and we adopted her. Are the dogs in your family, are, are the dogs that you have, are they like part of the family? Kind of. How about the cat? Just kind of came here, right? What, the, what Derpa helps to re, me to remember is that God is always with us. Always with us, and we are never, ever alone. The hug? The hurt spot? Yeah, she has a hurt spot. It's on under her chin. Well, she's, she's sick. So we're helping to take care of her. It's all, real. all real, dude. Oh. She is very real and very whiny. You know what she'll do? When she wants to be fed in the morning, she jumps up on the bed and puts her paw right on my nose. Time to get up. Feed me. Well, it sounds like this. That's what she means. When you go downstairs this morning, there are some things that you're going to do together that remind us that God's always with us. God always loves us. And we're never alone. Just like we adopted Derpa, and she adopted us, and now we're family. Ooh, how cool is that? Let's pray. God, thank you for family. Amen. I've got two things for you. One is to... Okay, we'll see you later. Thanks for coming up and for being my friends. Oh, yes.
A whinier cat you'll never meet in your life. I invite you, friends, to join your hearts and minds and spirits together with me in a moment of prayer. Holy Spirit, fill this place. Fill every heart. Fill our minds. Call our spirits to yours. Help us to hear and know the good news that is yours to share with us this day. For we would ask it and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You're watching a movie, you're watching a TV show, and somebody says something, and then all of a sudden, you know that what they just said or what they just did is important, except you don't have a context for it. So you know what's going to happen next. It's a flashback. The screen gets all wiggly and fuzzy, and then all of a sudden you are transported back to a time and a place where there's the context that you need. That's the value of a flashback to be reminded of, or to learn, or to discover, or for something to be in re reinforced that's important and in context. We are almost through the season of Easter, but this morning we get a flashback. Our Bible passage is a flashback to Maundy Thursday. And the context is Jesus and his friends gathered in the upper room. We know some things post-Easter that weren't apparent then. We're given a presence during Easter that was promised. From the Gospel according to John, the 14th chapter, verses 15 through 21. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides in you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is the word of the Lord. For some reason beyond my comprehension, maybe because there's a chance that somebody here today needs the message, from out of the blue, a quote 
came to my mind. I wasn't seeking it. I wasn't looking for it. It wasn't on my radar at all. But one morning, a quote came to mind. It was spoken by Christopher Robin, that young boy who rubs elbows with some of the inhabitants of the 100-acre wood from A.A. A. Milne's Winnie the Pooh books. The context for the quote is this. Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh are having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation in the upper branches of a sturdy oak tree. Christopher Robin is trying to communicate something important to the Winnie the Pooh, something caring, something deeply significant. And it's made even harder because all Winnie the Pooh can focus on is trying to catch fireflies that appear and disappear in the leaves. But Christopher Robin is determined. And he says in a very intentional and caring voice to the distracted Winnie the Pooh. If there is ever a tomorrow when we're not together, there is something you must always remember. You are braver than you believe. You are stronger than you seem, and you are smarter than you think. But the most important thing is, even if we are apart, I'll always be with you. I'll always be with you. Would you like to hear somebody say that to you? Would you like to hear somebody say to you, you, you are braver than you believe. You are stronger than you seem, and you are smarter than you think, and, and no matter what, come what may, no matter what, I will always be with you. I need that. I need that in my most anxious moments. Do you need that in your anxious moments? Do you have anxious moments? Can we avoid anxious moments? When we're anxious about the future, when we're anxious because we know how doggone vulnerable and frail we sometimes feel, when we're anxious with anticipatory grief about the prospect of separation from those who serve as an anchor in our lives. Anne Lamott claims to have a doctorate in morbid reflection, <laughs> along with a grave anxiety disorder, which she says is really not ideal for our times. <laughs> I can relate. I just have a PhD in anxiety. Of all the things in life that I do not need any help with, it is to be anxious. What I need help with is in response to that anxiety. 
which is why maybe I and you too could benefit by this morning's Bible passage being in that upper room with the closest friends of Jesus in this flashback as they are anxious. That quote from Christopher Robin was not on my radar. But when I read this passage, some dots started to connect as to where it came from. I think I've told you before, one of the most mysterious things in my life is how the Holy Spirit gives things to say when I don't have a clue as to what to say. I never have a clue as to what to say until I get it. So if I get it, I feel like, well, there you have it. Wasn't my idea. The upper room was not my idea. The plan was not my plan. The way things unfold isn't always the way I plan, expect, or want things to go. But in the middle of it, in the context of it, we are given promises. One who comes to us and helps us in connecting dots. The one that Jesus promised to be with his anxious disciples a long, long time ago and this very day in this very sanctuary. They weren't in the upper branches of a sturdy oak tree, but they were in that upper room and they were not distracted. Oh, they were laser focused. They were watching every move that Jesus made, every look on his face. They were locked in, in the way that kids are locked in and watch and listen when they know something serious is going on, even if they don't know what it is. You know when kids have their antenna up? Or when you have your antenna up because you get the hunch this is important. Jesus, like Christopher Robin, is determined to make it clear to his friends that he is not going to be with them in the way that he has been. Or as they have known him. All of us know that. All of us know that at some level. It comes to us with age. It comes to us when we are far more, <laughs> when we're a lot less naive than we want to be. We know. And despite knowing, despite this cognitive knowing, no one is ever really prepared to be an orphan, are they? Those people that you've known, that have been in your life all your life, how could you know life without them? We're never really prepared for that, and it doesn't matter how old you are when it happens. No one is prepared to be an orphan. And it's almost as if Jesus could read their minds, because in the next breath, he makes a promise to them that comes from the deepest of loves, a promise not made or taken lightly, a promise for you. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. You'll know him because he abides in you, and he will be in you. 
And I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming to you. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I love you. You're braver than you believe. You're stronger than you seem, and you're smarter than you think, but the most important thing is, if we are ever apart, I'll be with you, I'll always be with you. The word advocate is Greek, paraclete is what it says in the Greek, Paraclete is someone who comes alongside you, the best friend you will ever have. Not only as an advocate, but as a guide. As a comforter as the one who, when you need it most, whispers the words of encouragement that make the difference. The one who fills that place inside of us that is God-shaped, that brings exactly what we need as we need it, There are times when this advocate, this paraclete, is the fierce defender. It's the holy nudge when we're distracted by fireflies that keep appearing and disappearing. It's the holy embrace when we are most anxious. It's the holy reassurance when we wonder. When life is challenging and changing and we feel out of control and loving is hard, that paraclete comes to us, in us. And we can count on the paraclete to lead us in the most loving way forward, helping to create us into the best selves we can be and the ones we're meant to be. Friends, in this complicated world where the plans that I make aren't the plans that happen, in this complicated world where I feel vulnerable and frail, in this complicated world where I long for some respite from anxiety, we need and I need all the presence and the guidance and the reminders and the reassurance that I can get. For years, this particular church helped to support two mission co-workers. Mission co-workers who you didn't have to be around them for very long to tell that they were filled with the Spirit. Les and Cindy Morgan, he a doctor, she a nurse, were called into the mission field and went to a place. I mean, if you spread out a world map right now, they went to a place where I would not ever choose to go, Bangladesh one of the most crowded, poor, destitute places on the planet, and the Spirit sends them there. Unless 
is not only a good doctor, but a great storyteller. And, and he shared about a time when their calling was to go out into the poorest neighborhoods on the planet as the hands and feet of Christ. And he was in this house of somebody that was no bigger than a walk-in closet. And it was crammed with people who were sick, some people who were in need, some people who were just curious. What's going on here? And they were weighing people with borrowed bathroom scales, and they were measuring people with a tape measure up according to the, up on the doorpost, and into that chaos stepped Kalida and Siam. Kalida was carrying Siam because he couldn't walk himself. And Siam was squirmy and whiny and noisy. And that did not help matters in those small quarters. The woman, Kalita, said he couldn't feed himself or dress himself. And she said that Siam, this boy, this severely mentally retarded young boy was the son of her husband's second younger wife. Not even her son. Les Morgan said, I took Siam in my arms and laying him in my lap, placed him on his stomach and began to rub his back. He immediately calmed and quieted. Kalita then told me that Siam's mother had deserted the family as soon as she realized his condition. And from that moment on, Kalita had cared for him as her own son. He was getting what he needed. He had enough to eat and he had clean clothes on and you could tell that it was because someone had sacrificed on his behalf. Les Morgan said, the once noisy room was now silent as everyone listened to Kalita's story and watched Siam lying peacefully in my lap Amazed by the way she cared for her stepson, I explained to the group that Kalita was a channel of blessing to this child who is so loved by God. In this moment of peace, a shared human understanding resonated in all our hearts that in Khalid's sacrificial love for Siam, God was at work. God was at work. That in a language of love, a language that all people understand, God is at work. That in those places of deep anxiety, in those places where life is not the way we want it to be, God is at work. That there's this presence that comes alongside us and comes into us. And lo and behold, it is the very thing we need. Like a voice that whispers, you're braver than you believe. You're stronger than you seem, and you're smarter than you think. But the most important thing is, even if we're apart, 
I'll always be with you. I'll always be with you. Hmm. Thanks be to God. Friends, our hymn of response this morning is from the Sing the Faith hymnal, the blue slim hymnal in the pew racks or on the screen from, uh, it's number 2050. It's to a familiar tune, so uh, let's join together in singing Mother in God, You Gave Me Birth. Jesus said, come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. You, my friends, and I have all carried something, someone with us into this place. We're full of flashbacks. <laughs> we're we're full of all sorts of things, and we need a place a people, a spot where we know it's not only heard, but where it's safe to share. We need places where we can be ourselves, where we can let down the guard and be honest. In this time of prayer, I invite you to bring all that you are into the presence of the Holy One our advocate, let us pray. Eternal God, we rejoice today in the gift of life which we have received by your grace. Each of us, all of us are here, not by our own design, but by yours. Each of us share something in common that we needed help in getting here. <laughs> and that we all share that sacred one moment when coming out of a different place that was warm and secure and uninterrupted, you filled our lungs with air. You heard our first noises, and you have been filling us with air ever since. On this sixth Sunday of Easter and this Mother's Day, we pause to give you thanks for the people who have nurtured and protected us throughout our lives, mothers, grandmothers, stepmothers, foster mothers, and all those, regardless of gender or family bonds, who live into this role.
in this family where we do not share DNA, we give you thanksgiving for those who have shaped our faith lives, our journeys, who have told us good news, who have embodied your spirit, who have smiled upon us and told us the stories of your love. so that we, too, will have something to pass on. Opportunities to remember and honor the people we cherish. God of grace, we offer our prayers for the needs of others and commit ourselves to serve them even as we have been served in Jesus Christ. In this moment of prayer, we pause to remember those who are overwhelmed by the burdens of their lives, those who are exhausted from anxiety or from navigating uncertainty and change, those who struggle to be parents, to know how to parent, who sometimes wish they were better parents. Who need parents. We ask your presence with those who grieve the loss of children or other loved ones. those who need courage to move forward. Merciful God, you call us to journeys where we cannot see the destination, to paths that are sometimes confusing, or that we've never been down before, where it's always something new. Give us faith, to go out with courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us, that your love is supporting us, and that you are always with us. Finally, hear us now, God, as we pray the prayer that Christ taught us to pray, by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this, our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It was Jesus who not only said but embodied that it's more blessed to give than to receive, and we have discovered that in our own lives. And we have also discovered the blessing that comes from when we pass it on, when we know we have been the recipients of goodness and share that goodness so, dear friends. Let us bring forth our gifts, our tithes, our offerings, things that God will transform into holy gifts for another.
Holy God, these offerings are only a portion of all that we have received from you. We gratefully present them and entrust them to your work in this world. May our gifts share the good news of the gospel to those who are in need. May these gifts help unburden those with the heaviest of loads. We ask it and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, our closing hymn this morning is number 828, In the Glory to God, More Love to Thee, O Christ. Friends, please join me in the responsive benediction found in the bulletin. Go from this place in peace. May we leave this house of worship strengthened by the Spirit, renewed by God's grace, and reminded that the body of Christ surrounds us for help, comfort, and support. And may the grace, hope, Peace and love of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, be with us now and always.